Okay, this is a video for Astronomy 320. This is going to be review for the exam, which will be on Thursday, July 2nd. And then we'll cover just a little bit more material that will also be on that exam. Okay, and then here's your, um, here's the, uh, I got, you want to download this again. I updated this again. It'll be updated again, but you want to update it for the exam on, on Thursday. And then you've got the online lecture four. I just put up here. There it is, right there. So this we'll go over this in a little bit. So we want to review right now for the stuff that we've already covered. Okay. So if we go back and take a look, I've got um, your number one online astronomy. Uh, I should have put dates on these things, but okay. What was believed about falling objects? Different. Okay. So basically, the Greeks believed that the heavier mass, the greater mass, would fall faster. In the smaller mass, they never tried it. Galileo did. Okay, and we now we know that masses, different masses, will fall at the same rate. Okay, a reason a feather will fall slower than a coin or a, a hammer is because of air resistance. You go someplace where there is no re air resistance, like the moon, you see that they fall at the same rate. What is a light year? A light year is the distance that light travels in a single year. So if we go to our PowerPoint number one. Okay, what is science? And then it talks about the geometric. Um, so, a light year. So basically, if you bounce light back and forth between Sacramento and, I believe this was Placerville. Okay, well anyway, you, this is 30 miles. And so you, you bounce light back and forth between those two, Placerville. So in order for so in one single second, light would go back and then forth 6,200 times. It would make 3,100 round trips between Sacramento and Placerville. So uh, 6,200 times the distance between Sacramento and, Sto and, and Placerville, that is what we would call one light second, the distance that light travels in one second. Now close-up things. Uh, such as the moon, we talk about the moon being 1.28 light seconds away, okay? We talk about satellites being one point something light, or even less than that seconds away. When we get to the sun, then we get into minutes, okay? That's a little bit further away. It takes light from the sun, 8.32 minutes to get to us. Okay, then we get into the closer, closer planets. We're talking about minutes again, okay? Jupiter is farthest is almost an hour. Then we get up to Neptune, Uranus, those guys, we'll be talking about hours, okay? And then we talk about the stars. Now we get into light years. The closest sun, Proxima, Proximate, Proxima Centauri, that one's the closest star, and it's a whole 4.22 light years away. When you take a look at that light that started towards the Earth 4.22 light years away. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, 8.6 light years away, and then so on. Polaris is 433 light years away. So when you take a look at Polaris, that was about when Kepler was 16 years old. Galileo and Shakespeare were both about 23 years old. All right, and Betelgeuse is 642 light years away. That's really not that far, and people are hoping this guy goes supernova. So that's what a light year is. The distance of light travels in one year. I better not get too off here. Um, okay, list the planets in order of their distance from the sun. Well, it goes, Mercury is the closest, okay? Mercury is the closest. Mercury is the closest, followed by Venus, Earth would be next, then Mars, then Jupiter, then Saturn, then Uranus, and then Neptune. They'd be the furthest out. Okay. And then how old is the universe? It's about 5 billion years old. The PowerPoint isn't exactly in the um, proper order here. We go up here, we had this guy here. Okay, so that's the very beginning of the universe, and here we are. The, the age of the entire universe is 13.77 billion years. What did I say? Five, five billion years is how much longer the sun has, has to live. The, the, the age of the universe is 13.77 billion years, and development of galaxies and, and planets and all that only happened over here. Okay, first, the first stars were back here. And then here's where we are right now. So about 13.77 billion years old is how old the universe is. 
Okay, the distance we, we had, you saw all those, we just looked at all those, so let's not go through them again. <coughs> and then notice how <coughs> Neptune's in light hours, Jupiter was in light minutes, the Sun is in light minutes, and then the Moon was in light seconds. So we get out to the stars, they're in light years. We get out to the galaxy, they're in light years too, but a lot of light years. And then how, oh, how is the universe again? Okay, so this was the first one. And then the second one was this one. Okay, what defines an Earth day? So I believe that was PowerPoint here. So we started with the celestial sphere. That's imagining that the Earth is the center and everything orbits around the Earth. You even have the sun going up and down through the through the celestial equator. So right now, up here, this this is Cal this is where we are right here. So the sun's up here. Okay, that's why it's so hot. We get the sun a lot during the day, okay? But the sun will start going down and then we get to at autumnal equinox and it comes down here. So anyway, an Earth day is the time it takes the Earth to complete a 360 degree spin on its on its axis, a 360 degree rotation. Okay, so celestial sphere, you can see there it is. Um, so that is what an Earth day is. An Earth year is the time it takes the Earth to orbit the Sun, make one complete 360 degree orbit around the sun. That's, that's what defines an Earth year. Earth day, how long it takes the Earth to complete a, a, a 360 degree spin or rotation on its axis, about 24 hours. Earth year, time it takes the Earth to complete an orbit around the sun, about 365 days. Okay, why can we see Polaris from Sacramento all year round? That's where the PowerPoint was at this point. So, see, P Polaris would be up here. So I think if you go here, you, you take a look at Solaris or Polaris. We looked at that, and you can see Polaris all year round because it is going to be up here. So if we're here, we spin on Earth, we go like this. Polaris is always up here. It's always among the stars we can always see, like the stars of the Big Dipper or Ursa Major or Little Dipper. Okay. Um, so the constellation Ryan only part of the year. So again, we come back over here. Orion's going to be like here. So in the summer, for example, if this is the summer, the sun's in the way. Orion's up there, but the sun blocks everything out. Okay, and then the Orion goes with the sun. As we spin on our axis, the sun sets. Well, so does Orion. <coughs> now in the winter, if Orion's over here, okay, these stars we can see because we're turned away from the sun. We're over here, away from the sun. It's nighttime. Then we can see the Orion. Okay. So these stars stay where they are in the sky. They don't move. They move, but not, not, it's not perceivable from Earth. Okay, so that's why we can see certain constellations part of the year. They're the ones that are down here further. Can I see that picture? Oh. Okay, oh, here it is. This is the picture I want. So here's the stars we can see all year round. And then we can only see these guys part of the year, part of the year. Then these guys down here, we can't see. you got to go down to South America or Australia to see these guys. But then you can't see Polaris if you go down there. Okay, you can see these stars some of the times and these stars some of the times. Okay, so basically that's the way that works. Okay, um, what culture is given credit for attempting to formulate theories to try to explain the natural universe? Is the first culture that we have seen in historical writings that actually tried to use rational explanation for why things were the way they were were the Greeks okay the Greeks were not happy with uh, saying that um, I don't know who's put somebody's pulling the, the Sun across the sky uh, and then someone else is uh, holding up the earth and, and all that kind of stuff they wanted to have rational reasons they came up with some good ones but basically a lot of them were not correct because they didn't have a full understanding of the way the universe worked but it got sort of a started then we went into the dark ages and then Galileo came along, and then during the Dark Ages, we just believed whatever the Greeks said, didn't try anything. Okay, the Greeks believed in heavenly perfection. What constant did this, what constraint did this place on the orbits of the planets? That meant the planets had to be in perfectly circular orbits. They could not be elliptical as, as Kepler found out that they were later. They had to be perfect circles, and every theory had to fit that they are perfect circles. Okay, the Greeks argued that Earth was in motion 
if Earth was in motion, parallax, closer stars moving relative to distant stars, would be observed. In other words, you're standing there, you got one person standing five feet in front of you, then another person standing five feet behind that person. You start to move to your right, well, it looks like the person in front of you is moving faster than the person away from you. You can actually start to see the person. They look like they're moving relative to each other. Well, the problem is if you take those same people and put them like three miles away and put them five feet apart, you move a little bit to your right, you're not going to be able to perceive the parallax. They're too far away. Same thing with the stars. They're too far away to see the parallax. Like the closest star is 4.2 light years away. The other ones are like 500, 600 thousands of light years away. So they're too far away. The Greeks did not understand that. And that's why their, their argument about the parallax, it, it doesn't work, but they just didn't know any, any better. The Potomac model of the universe by T Ptolemy, that was the sun at the center and all the, I mean, sorry, the earth at the center. The earth at the center and everything in the universe orbited the earth in perf perfectly circular orbits. Nicholas Copernicus is kind of giving credit first for placing the Sun at the center of the universe we now know as the center of the solar system, not the universe. Now he tried to stick to the Greeks perfect circle idea which made his model not very accurate. Okay, Tycho Brahe was the guy who uh, accumulated this incredible amount of data, just huge, huge, huge amounts of data. Okay, and then um, basically he, he didn't know what to do with his data, a lot of mathematical stuff, and so basically he, somehow Johannes Kepler got a hold of it. Kepler was a mathematical genius. He was able to make sense out of Tycho Brahe's work, and there's all sorts of stories about Tycho Brahe gladly, gladly handed his, his work over to, to Brahe, Brahe on his deathbed. There's other rumors that <laughs> Brahe told his children not to let Kepler have them. Kepler went and stole them anyway. Who knows what the truth is? We don't know anymore. Okay, so anyway, Brahe was the one who accumulated the data. Then Kepler was able to come up with three laws of planetary motion. So basically you have, uh, let me go find it on the PowerPoint. So the PowerPoint stuff, here's all the stuff we just talked about. I got trying to go fast because the longer I take, the longer it's going to take to upload. So you can see this was the problem with the parallax. Uh, this was retro, this is the parallax problem here. See, they, they said they, if you line up and the earth moves a little bit, then you should see them not lined up anymore. The problem is they always look like they'd be the same position in the sky relative to each other. And the problem is the Greeks just did not know how far away these stars were, and, you, and we can't perceive that parallax. Okay, and then uh, precession, this is stuff you're not going to have on quizzes because it's not on the questions. Concluding thoughts about, okay, Copernicus, okay, we just talked about him. Tycho Brahe, we just talked about him. Kepler, okay, that's who we're talking about now. Then his first law, the orbit of each planet about the sun is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. Kepler's second law, a planet moves faster in the part of its orbit near the sun and slower when the farther from the sun, sweeping out equal areas in equal amounts of time. Or the more customary way to say it is an imaginary line joining a planet and the sun will sweep out equal areas in equal amounts of time. And then the third law basically is that uh, um, the more distant planets orbit the sun at a slower average speeds obeying the precise mathematical relationship, the period squared, how long it takes the planet to orbit the sun, equals the distance, average distance from the sun cubed. So this is in, uh, period is in Earth years, and if A is in um, astronomical units, one astronomical units, the uh, average distance between the sun and the Earth, then that is, we can put equals there, okay, as long as we use those units. Okay, so those were the three laws of Kepler's planetary motion. All right, so some of the important contributions by Galileo. Galileo discovered there are moons orbiting a Jupiter, which was a huge deal. Okay, so father of modern science. Remember, he's the one that dropped the two objects. Maybe not from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but he did a lot of experiments to disprove what the Greek theory was. He, he improved the telescope. Uh, he went and used the telescope to discover all sorts of things, like our moon was not a smooth pearl-like object, but in fact, its surface was peppered with craters and mountains. Venus went through phases just like the moon. That's more evidence that Venus is orbiting the sun and not the Earth. Discovered moons orbiting Jupiter. These are now referred to as the Galilean moons. Also discovered sunspots on the sun, which means he was looking at the sun through his telescope. Yikes. Uh, talk about major eye damage, and he did go blind later in life. He may have discovered Uranus. Okay. Uh, 
because remember, we, we think of Uranus and Neptune. They did, were not known to the ancients. They were not discovered until the age of the telescope. So perhaps the, Galileo made some notes. He noticed this object that was not moving with the background stars, but had independent motion. That means it's something that was orbiting the sun, okay? Because the only reason you see the stars move the way they do is because of Earth's rotation. That's it, okay? But if something's moving relative to the background stars, it's not there with the background stars. It must be in our solar system. But he didn't really follow up and didn't continue to do observations on it. So there's a, a one similar to the one Galileo built. And so he discovered Earth not okay. So we, we've just gone through all this. I don't want to spend time on it now. Um, let's see, what's the next question you guys had on here? Um, so, um, state, okay, Sir Isaac, Sir Isaac Newton's first law, an object at rest or in motion with a constant velocity will remain in that state unless acted upon by a net force. So things want to keep doing what they're already doing. If they're at rest, they want to stay at rest. If they're in motion with a constant velocity, that means constant speed in a straight line, they want to remain in that state. And you're going to have to apply a force to them to keep them out, keep them from doing what they already want to do. It's called the law of inertia also. Things want to keep doing what they're already doing. Okay, Sir Isaac Newton's second law is force equals mass times acceleration. So that the, he relates those three variables. Acceleration equals force over mass. So if you apply a certain force to a certain mass, you can predict what acceleration it's going to have. Okay. Also, the third law is that for every force, there's an equal and oppositely directed force. Every object applies an equal and opposite direct object opposite, opposite force on every other object that's being applied to it. The, the Earth pulls down on an apple. The apple pulls back up on the Earth with an equal but oppositely directed force, equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. The other things Newton did, um, he invented a new type of telescope, which was very efficient. He, he came up with the calculus, the both integral and der derivative calculus. Uh, and also, he um, just uh, did tons of work in optics, uh, just a lot of stuff. Now, remember, since, uh, oops, wrong one, I think. Since, uh, yeah, so uh, Newton's first law, Newton's second law, Newton's third law. Final thoughts on Newton's laws of motion. Right, you have the whole period to work on this. The thing is, I know that I'm not going to make any rules about not being able to use PowerPoint and not being able to use the uh, online worksheets because then honest students won't use them, and then not so honest students will use them, and then I'll be giving the not so honest students an uh, advantage. It's not like we're in the classroom and I can watch what you're doing. I can't. Okay, I'm not going to be peeking in your window while you're taking this. So what I'm going to do is say you, you can use the worksheet, you can use PowerPoint, but remember, I know you have access to PowerPoint and the worksheets when I'm making the quiz. So the quiz is probably going to be more challenging than it, it would normally be, so you may want to make sure you know where everything is. So some of the things that weren't on the worksheet but are here on PowerPoint, I won't put a lot of them on there, but I may put some of them on there, okay? Because it's in PowerPoint, and I'm giving you access to PowerPoint when you, do, when you take the exam. It's better if you just didn't get access to either one, then the quiz would be pretty, you know, simple. I think you just as long as people studied, but because people are not going to be honest with it, I already know that. Then uh, you can use both of them. But remember, I know that you have access to both of them. All right. Uh, so this is more stuff that you want to probably look through if you haven't already. And then um, so we have the contributions. You can look at those in the in the PowerPoint. So now if we go to, so there's this one. <coughs> okay, this is, is this the same one? Or did I just click on the same one? That's one. That's two. That's three. I guess we're on this one then. Okay, what is mass? What is volume? So that one goes with uh, this one here, I think. Mass, okay. Mass is the amount of stuff packed into a volume. Inertia is, the greater the mass, the greater the inertia. Inertia is something is lazy, it wants to stay right where it is. That coin wants to stay right there. You pull it out fast enough, the frictional force is not great enough to give that coin that acceleration it's going to fall right into the water, okay, because it wanted to stay right there. Things want to stay where they are, and or if they're in motion with a constant velocity, they want to remain in, the, in motion with a constant velocity. 
and then we have uh, more inertia stuff. And we have uh, then there's a Eureka video about inertia. There's also a Eureka video about volume you can watch. And then there's mass versus weight. Is that where we are? Yeah. So mass is a property of your body. It depends on how much stuff is in your body. If you want to gain mass, then you sit on the couch, you drink milkshakes, you eat a lasagna, uh, whatever is really fattening, and you watch, uh, can't watch PD Live, they took that off. You watch, what do you watch? You watch uh, Seinfeld and Frasier and, and, and whatever's popular now to watch. Okay, then you will gain mass. If you want to lose mass, then you got to like eat broccoli and drink water and take long walks along the American River. Or I took a long walk this morning in Phoenix Park here in Fair Oaks, so I'm trying to lose mass, okay? Now, if all you want to do is lose weight, then you can go to the moon. See, same mass, this girl has the same mass everywhere, okay? Uh, same mass, same mass, same mass. Okay, mass is always 56 kilograms. The weight on the Earth, because it depends on the mass and how strongly the Earth pulls down on her. So, weight is a force. It's not a property of your body. It, it depends on other things outside of your body, how they are pulling up, pulling on you. The earth pulls down on you, that's your weight. How much the earth is pulling down on you? Earth pulls down on you. Now, the earth will pull down on some 300 pound NFL lineman with a greater force than it does a, a, you know, a small ballerina, okay? So mass does have an impact on what the weight is, but so does the uh, force of gravity where you are. Okay, then Eureka video, you can watch the weight. So there's a Eureka video, you can watch. Volume is the amount of space an uh, object or a substance takes up, and then you don't have to know these formulas here, but just as an example of what we talk about, we have, vo we have volume formulas, or they all, some of them are right there. Density is mass per volume. How much mass is packed into that volume, okay? It's a ratio, mass per volume. And it's in kilograms per meter cubed or grams per centimeter cubed. Uh, a sugar cube is about a gram per centimeter cubed. Okay, it's, it's about one gram and it's about one centimeter cubed, almost perfect. Uh, water is one gram per centimeter cubed. That's how they come up with the definition of mass, I believe. Then you have here some of the densities in grams per centimeter cubed. You can see water is exactly one. Uh, wood is a little bit less than one, uh, typically. You've got rock a little bit more than one, so on, okay? Okay, so let's see where that gives us on our we're doing this one now. So we did mass, did volume, did density, did inertia, weight versus mass, uh, conservation of angular momentum. Okay, basically, which the, it, it's a conserved quantity. It's it's something turning round, 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 round has a certain angular momentum. Okay, and that angular momentum is conserved. It depends on the mass, depends on the radius, and it depends on the velo the, the angular velocity or the rate of spin. Okay. Now, assuming the mass stays the same, if you reduce one of those other two, the radius or the spin rate, the other one has to go up. <laughs> so figure skater reduces her, her, uh, her radius. Figure skater reduces her radius. That means she's going to have to spin faster because her, conserva her angular momentum has to be conserved. Now, where is it important for us? Well, when uh, a big, huge cloud shrinks, Okay, it's spinning and it shrinks. It gets its radius goes down. It starts spinning faster and faster. And then when it finally forms something like a solar system with the sun at the middle, okay, that it inherited that spin rate from the um, spin rate from. Um, let me take a break. I'm getting mentally tired. Okay, where angular momentum conservation of angular momentum is going to become important for us is when a a huge cloud collapses and that cloud has all these elements that came from stars that blew up a long time ago it contains gold silver lead oxygen <coughs> all these other elements and it's going to collapse and, sh and flatten and as it collapses and flattens it's going to spin faster and faster and faster and that causes a problems with it trying to form stuff because stuff that rotates tends to have stuff fly off of it too all right so anyway that's where it'll become important for us in a later chapter and that might be a good question for the exam since I'm having trouble coming up with questions for the exam. Okay. <coughs> then we got into Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation. I think we're looking at this one. Um, what did Newton recognize about the force of gravity? That it went out beyond the Earth. Okay. They just associated before him things fall to the ground. It had the name gravity or whatever the Latin would have been for gravity. Gravitas or something like that. So... 
they, they saw that it was something on Earth, and Newton made the made the huge intellectual leap that that same thing that causes things on the Earth to fall to the ground is the same thing that keeps the Earth in orbit around the Sun or the Moon in orbit around the Earth. Okay, so we can see it here with the uh, which one are we at? Okay, like here. So you're talking about firing a cannonball. This is Newton's thought experiment. So it's an experiment you do through your brain. You think. So you fire it, boom, you put some more uh, gunpowder in there, you fire it, it goes a little bit further, put enough gunpowder, boom, you send it in an orbit around the, the, the Earth. So the cannonball is continuously falling towards the Earth, but then the Earth curves out away from it. The, the, <coughs> the Earth is continuously, the Earth wants to do this, it wants to fly off in a straight line, but it's continuously falling towards the Sun. Okay, so let's move on. All right, um, looking at Newton's equation for gravitational force between two bodies, what can you say about what would happen with the force we, okay. Remember it goes as the distance between them squared on the bottom, one over that. Okay, so if we take a look at the equation, there it is. See, that's the distance between them. If we double that, so we go from one to two, we go from one squared, one, to two squared, four. Uh, four. So you went to one fourth of what it was. If we go from two squared, four, to 4 squared, 16, 16 divided by 4 is still 4. So by doubling the distance between them, we, we would reduce the force between them by a fourth of what it was. If we tripled it, then that'd be 1 squared, 1, 3 squared, 9. We reduce it to 1 ninth of what it was. Okay, and it follows this curve right here. All right. Um, again, because, where am I? No, we're here, right? Okay. What past discoveries did Newton's laws give a mathematical framework to? Okay. Galileo dropped the two masses, two different masses from a height. He found that they both fell and hit the ground at the same time. But he couldn't explain why that was quite yet. He came up with a lot of things that Newton incorporated into his laws, but nothing was the smoking gun of, oh, this is the way it is. Newton's laws explains why uh, the two objects fell to the ground at the same rate. Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, those are observations. They don't explain why that happens. Why are the orbits elliptical? Why is the uh, period squared equal to the distance from the sun cubed? Why, why is that? Okay, uh, Kepler observed that, he didn't explain it. If we dig deeper into Newton's laws, we can show mathematically why that is true. Okay, now the two, uh, there's many, many accomplishments but the two that I talked about, Haley's Comet. Haley was a friend of Newton's. He, the comet visited during his lifetime. He used Newton's laws of motion to predict when it would return. And sure enough, <coughs> 76 years later, it returned. And that's how it got the name Haley's Comet. And then the other one was the discovery of Neptune. Uh, it was observed that there were discrepancies in the orbit of Uranus. And so instead of saying, well, Newton's laws are wrong, they believed in Newton's laws so much, they said there must be something out there that's applying a gravitational force to Uranus to cause these, these differences that we're seeing based on prediction. They went, they said, this is where it must be. It must be right about here in this orbit. They went looking for it using Newton's laws. They found it. It was Neptune, okay? Okay, what is wavelength? Are we on the next, ch we're probably on the next chapter. Let's go look at the PowerPoint. We are looking at this PowerPoint right now, right? Gravity, we talked about gravity, Newtons, all this good stuff. Uh, okay, that's the end. Okay, so now we are on to the one that we did most recently. That's this guy. Okay, so we talked about light, behavior of light. Okay, um, the medium that we deserve, we create light. Okay, creating light. Uh, it's a disturbance in Earth's gravitational field. And you can think of it like you, you, you take a satellite, you put it near the Earth, you put another satellite far from the Earth. The one near the Earth is going to feel a much larger gravitational force than the one further from the Earth, okay? But just Newton's universal law of gravitation, right? The one that's further from it, the distance squared, so that's going to be a much smaller force. You move the Earth to the other end, not moving the satellite, suddenly the one that felt the big force now feels a small force. The one that felt the small force now feels a big force. Same thing with electrons and protons. So you have the electron here, the proton feels a big electromagnetic force. This one feels a tiny one. You move the electron across to the other side. Now this guy's got a small electromagnetic force. This one's got a big electromagnetic force. So you keep vibrating the ele electron back and forth. You keep disturbing the electromagnetic field 
and that's how these waves move out into space, how light waves move out into space. <coughs> okay, we need to understand wavelength, distance between two identical consecutive points on a wave. We needed to understand amplitude, distance from equilibrium to crest is the best way. We needed to understand wave speed, how fast the wave is moving. We needed to understand frequency, uh, how, many, how, how many cycles does it complete per second or unit of time. So cycles per second, how many cycles per second. And then we needed to understand period, how many seconds per cycle. How long does it take a, a wave to complete a cycle. And then we had th these relationships, the frequency and the period are inverses of each other. Okay, so if you had a period of 10 seconds, the frequency would be 0.1 hertz. Okay, because they're inverses of each other. You take 1 over 10, you get 0.1. And then wave speed is distance over time. We could have a uh, wavelength over period, but we like to s use frequency. Frequency equals 1 over the period, so you can write this as velocity equals wavelength times the frequency. Okay, here we're on to the new stuff that's for the exam tonight. Now, this is a brand, this is, this is the newest one here, all right? So let's, let's look at the other one. We finished up the other one. What is wavelength? This is between two consecutive identical points on a wave. What is amplitude? Distance from equilibrium to the peak. Wave speed is how fast the wave is going. Frequency is cycles per second. How many complete cycles do we get in a single second? And it's in hertz. And then a period is how long it takes the wave to complete a cycle. And then a relationship between frequency and period. Uh, frequency is one over the period. Period is one over the frequency. They're inverses of each other. Relationship between wave speed, frequency, and wavelength. Wave speed is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Of course, then frequency would be equal to the speed divided, divided by the wavelength. Wavelength would be equal to speed divided by the wave speed. Okay, so now we're on to the new stuff. There's not a whole lot of it. Okay, <coughs> and this will be up tonight, so you have all day tomorrow to study it. Uh, I'll get up and I'll send out a, a, they call it a blast email. I never heard that from my, my 107s last semester when, when I would send out one of these huge emails to everybody. They call it a blast email, so that sounds like a good term, but I, that's the only person I've ever heard to use it. So I'll send out a blast email. Of course, you've gotten the blast email by the time you're, you're watching this. All right, so let's go to the last one. It's already, see, it's, it's here. Uh, here it is. It's here, this one here. Online lecture 320.004 for exam one. So it's published. That means it's been published. See, if I do this, then, oops, I don't know what that did. So I can unpublish it, right? But I don't want to unpublish it, so it's published. Uh, update, I didn't do anything to it. It's still published, okay? All right, so there it is, and then here it is on my computer. It is this one over here, okay? Okay, so this covers the material for exam one that was not covered on the quizzes. All right, so this is just the, the new stuff that I'll try to come up with multiple choice questions from or true-false questions from. Now, what do we mean when we say light has a dual nature? Okay, for, for ages and ages, okay, going back to Huygens and people like that, it was thought that light was a wave, okay? Light has a dual nature. In some experiments, light behaves as a wave, but in other, <coughs> others, light behaves as a particle. We call this particle a photon. A photon is a particle rep representing a quantum of light or other electromagnetic radiation. A photon carries energy proportional to the radiation frequency, but has zero rest mass, okay? It's a massless packet of energy, basically. Okay, light as a wave. To understand light as a wave, we need to understand constructive and destructive interference. Now here you have two waves that line up. See the peak to peak? The peaks line up, they add together. Look at this big wave compared to these guys. That is constructive interference. They add up to give you, <coughs> they sum up to give you a bigger wave, okay? Destructive interference. Look at the trough and the crest line up. Okay, these are out of phase. These are in phase, these are out of phase. So the trough and the crest line up and they cancel. They annihilate each other. They, they cancel out. Okay, That's destructive interference. So then we have the Huygens or just double slit experiment. Two ways pass through slits. So you can think of what you're looking at here. These lines represent the peaks of waves. So you got one wave coming in. Well, what that does is it splits it up into two different waves. So some of this wave goes through there. Some of this wave goes through there. And when they come out, here are the peaks, okay? 
the peaks are going along like this in a curved form. And then when they reach here, if they hit peak to peak, we get a bright line. If they hit peak to trough, we get a dark line. And we get also in between too. We could have it hitting at different places. But at the spots we get peak to peak, we get the, the, the bright. The part, parts we get peak to trough, we get the dark part. Okay, because remember, they've got to travel different. This one here has to travel a longer distance to get to here. So they're not going to come in and phase normally and only once in a while they come in in phase but where the peak to peak hits okay same thing happens on this side we'll get a pattern on the wall that looks like this creates a pattern on the wall of dark spots on the wall light and dark spots on the wall so that's showing that light acts like a wave now light as a particle so you would think if we're using the classical uh, definition of, of light that light was a wave that what you would do you could take some dim light any color any any color dim light shine it on a piece of metal and you know electrons are going to absorb that energy and then jump off dim light it would just take a longer amount of time you shine the dim light on there and it's got to build up energy got to build up energy got to build up energy then the electrons can start to jump off okay well that's not what they found okay they found that that they could put light on there dim light dim light dim light nothing ever happened nothing ever happened nothing ever happened when they started increasing the frequency, in other words, they messed with the frequency, not the dimness or brightness of the light, but the frequency of the light, then they started to see electrons jumping off by, by messing around with the frequency. <coughs> so that could not be explained by the wave model. So an individual by the name of Albert Einstein proposed that light can also act like a particle, and his theory explained this observation. So we're not going to go into the photoelectric effect in detail but just know that's an experiment that cannot be explained by wave theory this guy up here gets explained beautifully by wave theory this one cannot now an electron also acts like a wave they actually did this experiment with electrons and they got these guys and we think of electrons as a particle so electrons have a dual nature too they can act like a particle or a wave also this is all quantum mechanics incredibly interesting stuff all right so visible region we're just we're going to talk about the whole electromagnetic uh, spectrum but that's going to be after the exam so the part that we're going to focus on is just the part that deals with visible light the part of the, is the, the that part that we can see it goes radio infrared visible ultraviolet x-ray gamma ray we're just going to look at the visible part of the spectrum right now so the visible part of the spectrum that is the part that we can actually see with our eyes okay we will learn about the other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum later going from the longest wavelength that's the lowest energy to the shortest wavelength highest energy the order is red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay, red has the longest wavelength, then green, then violet would have the shortest wavelength. And I didn't put the other ones in, but these are three examples. Okay, wavelengths getting shorter and shorter. All right, so best way to remember that Roy G. Biv. You may have heard of that in your art class, but it works great for this as too. Roy, red, R is red, O is orange, Y is yellow. G is green, blue, a V is blue, I is indigo, V is violet. Okay, violet has the shortest wavelength, here it is, then indigo, then blue, that's the high energy. Red has the lowest energy, okay, that has the longest wavelength. Okay, it also has the lowest frequency, these are the high frequencies, do the wavelengths getting shorter? So that means higher frequency because you're going to have more cycles per second, right? So these are longer wavelengths, you're not going to get as many cycles per second, so a lower frequency. The medium energy, and then you got so you got the red, orange, yellow, Roy, then you got the middle initial green G, then you got Viv, blue, indigo, violet. So that's a, a mnemonic, which is a way to remember the order. Red, just remember, is the longest wavelength, lowest energy among these guys. Red has more energy than a radio wave or um, or infrared. Violet is the most energetic <coughs> and has the shortest wavelength of these guys and the highest frequency of these guys, but it's still, again, the whole electromagnetic spectrum, it has less energy and a longer wavelength than ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma ray. Okay, so basic types of spectra. The top picture, probably should have made this bigger. Um, the top picture is just all light. It's like a rainbow. That's all the light. Okay, you got this uh, white light source, you put it into a prism or a diffraction grating, or something and it splits it up into all the colors. Now this one here, what you do is you take a gas and you uh, excite it somehow. Now if we were actually in class, I'd pull out these discharge tubes, 
we plug them in, put a huge voltage across them, causing the atoms to smack into each other. That's collisional energy that gets turned into electron energy. Electrons go to higher orbitals, then they fall back down. Okay, and what we would get are certain lines. See, these are the certain lines. You may have to go in closer on this um, here. Okay, so this was the entire spectrum here. Then this is just the part that gets emitted from this cloud of gas. A bunch of these are missing. We don't get those. And then, so this is an excited gas. Now we turn it around. This is a cool gas. This is a cool gas. The, the, the book doesn't really say that. This is a cool gas. We're shining light through it. This is all the colors. This is, this is, we're trying to get this up here. We're trying to get this down here. Okay, but we don't. We're missing lines. And look at that. They're the same exact lines that were emitted up here. So when people first saw this, okay, they, they, these were observations, but why does this happen? How can this be happening? Light is a wave. How does this happen? Again, this is the hot gas. These are called emission lines. Hot gas, we excite it. We put a huge voltage across it. We excite the electrons up in the higher energies. They fall back down. They only give off discrete light uh, spectra. On the other hand, we take the gas, we have it really, really cool. It could be hydrogen gas, it could be helium gas, it could be mercury gas, sodium gas, it, it could be a molecular gas, whatever, we'll see the same thing. Take this gas, cool it down, it's not excited, so by itself it's not emitting much. Then we shine the same light through it that we expect to get the entire rainbow, except we're missing, we're missing these guys, okay? That, those are called absorption lines. So we come down here, and let me make this back to something so we can read again. Okay, so emission lines. When a cloud of gas is excited, it emits certain discrete frequencies. These frequencies will tell us what the gas is made of. The different elements and molecules emit frequencies unique to them. The unique spectra from all these different elements and molecules identify them in the same way fingerprints and DNA identify a person. In other words, they all have different uh, spectral lines. That's why we can look at a distant star. People look at distant stars and say, oh, that's got like 2.3% mercury in its atmosphere. Well, how the heck do they know that? We never sent a probe up there, grabbed a sample of that star's atmosphere, and brought it back to Earth and said, oh, this is the percentage of mercury. Because if it's like, you know, Beetle, like, like what is uh, Betelgeuse 600 something uh, light years away, uh, it would have to be 1,200 years ago that civilization sent something up towards Betelgeuse that could travel at the speed of light, go collect its its uh, contents and then come back down at the speed of light and it would just be arriving back to Earth right now because it's got to make the round trip. Okay, it, it, it just doesn't, doesn't have to go the 600 some odd light years one way, it's got to go the almost 1300 light years round trip. So we'd have to go back 1300 years to that civilization to do it. So obviously we've never done this. Okay, but the light comes to us. The light comes to us, we make the assumption that physics is the same everywhere in the universe. So whatever we see in the lab, if you look the same thing and see it in a star, hey, it's the same thing, so we know what that star is made up, we know what's going on with that star. All right, now here's what's happening. we got an electron, and it's orbiting a nucleus. Okay, unlike the world we use, electrons can only exist in discrete energy states. This electron can exist in this energy state, but it can't exist anywhere in between. This is like no man's land. This is like in World War I, the trenches. So you had the Germans in the trench, you had the Americans, the British, and the French in the trenches up here. And if you got in between, you got blown up or you got killed somehow. So this was no man's land for the electrons. They can exist here, and they can exist here. Okay, but they can't exist in between. Okay, and there's other energy levels. I simplified this. It's a lot more complicated. There'll be a bunch of other energy levels as well. Okay, we can excite the electron up here, up to there, okay? So, like, we, we cause collisions. And then it's going to give off a photon gives off a green photon. So that, that energy difference is going to be the energy of this green photon that's moving away. Okay. Now, lower energy photons, like, like what's lower than, than, just think of Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow. They're all lower energy than the green. So we would not see red, orange, or yellow photons from this atom. Okay, because the electron can't fall from those orbitals because it can't exist in those orbitals. Now again, it's more complicated. It could fall from an orbital up here down to this one and give off a red. But the point is, they're only going to be very discrete 
very limited, very, very small range of frequencies, okay? So you're not going to have a whole spectrum. You're only going to get certain frequencies as a result of this. Okay, fairly quickly, the electron will fall back down to a lower energy. Let's see, that's continued up here. Electrons can get excited to higher energy levels through a number of natural phenomena. They can, they can absorb light and go to a higher one, or the, the one we do in class, if we were in class, would be to use a discharge tube and to basically um, put a high voltage across it and see the resulting spectral lines that come out of it based on the electrons relaxing back down to the lower states, like this right here. Okay, the greater the energy difference, the greater the frequency of the emitted photon, okay? Among visible light, violet would have the highest frequency, red would have the lowest. Red has the longest wavelength and the lowest energy, and it also has the lowest frequency. Uh, violet has the largest frequency, it also has the highest energy, but the shortest wavelength. So absorption lines, electrons needs to absorb enough energy to get from the ground state to the next level. So here's this orange one going through, or red, I got it as red. Red one going through. The red might get the electron up to here, okay? The electron, that's no good for, the, that's supposed to be the electron right there. Okay, the electron would get to there. That's no good, that's no man's land. So that goes through, okay? So we see those guys, there we are. We see them in, up here. We see, we see the reds. By the way, this is opposite of the way I'm doing it. Because I got red over here, but it just it's just reversed, okay? And so, so it lets, the, it lets the red go, but then along comes our yellow one. That's got more energy than the red. Remember, Roy, red, orange, yellow? So that might be perfect for getting the electron up into the next orbital that it wants to be in. Therefore, when we take a look at these absorption lines we had way up here, these guys up here, these are the absorption lines, so we might be missing a yellow here. We get that red, but we wouldn't be missing that yellow, for example because it wouldn't get through. Now, does it get re-emitted? Yes, but but see, the light was going in this direction. Our detector's over here. When, it gets, when, the, when the electron falls back down, that yellow could get emitted that way, that way, that way. In other words, there's very, very low probability that the yellow light would get re-emitted in the same direction it was already heading in. That's why we don't see them. They're getting emitted, they got absorbed, and they get re-emitted in random directions. So we get the dark absorption line there. Okay, this is a good video to watch. Okay, we're not going to watch it here. If we were in class, I'd show it to you. But you can watch it yourself. You can do that. And this talks about the spectral lines. you got the emission lines. Now, he's in the same order I'm in. Okay, I like Roy G. Biv. Like, you read from left to right. So I like to put the red over here and the violet over here and so on. So he's got the same order I have. Just remember that these ones that are from someplace I got them. I should probably do a... I could probably reverse that image, huh? But here, you, they got the reds over here and the violets over here. But it's just that means the, the longer wavelength, lower energy is over here. The higher energy, shorter wavelengths are over here. That's all that means. Okay, that's everything. All right, on the exam on Thursday, I'm going to have this up tonight. So it's Tuesday night. Uh, it's going to take, let's see, it might take, I don't know how long it's going to take. But I'll get up, when this is done uploading, I'll write you the note and tell you this exists. So you may, you'll see it tomorrow morning at the uh, latest. And so when this is up so you can watch this. So now the exam on Thursday, I haven't even started it yet. It's hard to make these exams and put them up, up on, on Canvas, but I'm thinking 25 questions, four points each, or 33 questions, three points each, and I'll just give you a free point to make it an even 100. Um, probably 25 questions, four points each, because it's hard to come up with questions, honestly. Um, now remember, I'm going to assume you have complete access to the worksheets you have complete access to these PowerPoints. So you want to you make, make sure you know where stuff is on these guys. Okay? There's, and by the way, there's one more slide here. We're going to save this for, for after. Right? There's, there's more i got to do on this. This is Again, this is a work in progress. You're going to be downloading this again. Just download it over the one you already have. Just replace the one you already have in, after the exam. Okay? So, this you need to download this again and replace the one you already have. Because like I said, this is a work in progress. I've never taught this over the uh, over the internet before. Okay, so that's why I, this is all brand new to me. So that's why none of this stuff is stuff I'm going. I'm not going back to old stuff I have built up over the years. It's this is I got to do this from scratch now. So you've got access, and I'm going to assume when I make up this quiz or this exam, I mean that you have access to all this, all the stuff we just went over, all the stuff we talked about. Okay, the, it, I'm going to use this the powerpoints 
I'm going to mostly focus on trying to get questions off the worksheets. So when I run out of ideas off the worksheets, I'm going to look at what I had in the PowerPoints. So, you know, who knows, that might differentiate the people who get the, I don't know, I mean, everybody's doing so well that I've seen so far. It might differentiate the 88% from the 90, 97%. So I don't know, people went through them, knew where everything was in PowerPoint or whatever. So anyway, that's the whole point. So I'm just letting you know now that I'm going to make up the exam probably starting later as this thing is uploading. So I can't use the internet when this thing's uploading anyway. And then, so that'll be just about everything. I think this may be an hour long. So let me call it quits right now and I'll send out, I'll send out a blast email.